A very good evening to you. Welcome to this wonderful production. My name is Nokip Kimboy, and today our focus is matters to do with economics. And there is a new idea being born. For the longest time, the world has operated in a particular format. And that particular format, we've seen a lot of upheavals. Lots of swings. Talk about COVID-19. Talk about technological disruptions. It's changing everything. Question is, now with the new world that we are in, should we have new ways of thoughts? Should we have new ways of conceptualizing our economies? Well, today we have a new idea. Solomonic economics. And welcome to its public lecture. My name is Nokip Kimboy, and today is going to be a great day because we are having a new idea at play, and it's always beautiful to have that. So, without wasting much time, as you can tell, a lot of questions. What is this Solomonic economics? What does it mean to me? Seated at home, seated here in this particular audience, what is the impact that we expect from this? Those are the questions that we're going to be answering today and how you can apply this. So, without wasting much time, since we have the word Solomon, and um, you understand Solomon comes from the Bible. So we'll start with a word of prayer, briefly, and thereafter, we'll have the keynote address. So, at this particular moment, I'd like to call on a young man. This gentleman came and said hi to me before we started the program. I'd like to welcome uh, Kamwana Maxwell, Maxwell, please just approach. You look sharp. Please. Thank you very much. Clap for him, please. Encourage this young man. He's going to pray for us. I know sometimes you're tempted to pray for the weather and what happens with El Nino. Just keep it brief to the Solomonic issue. Is that okay? Absolutely. Opening prayers. Let's bow our heads uh, for a word of prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to sit down here, Lord. Uh, meditate, think, converse, oh God, about matters, Solomonic economics. We thank you, Father, for this audience. We thank you for this gathering. And we pray that you shall get the best out of it. Your word says, to whom much is given, much is expected. And much you have given to uh, Professor Fred. And so much is expected of him. And help us as we support him in this course. In Jesus' name we do pray and believe. Amen. And thank you very much. Come on, Maxwell, for the opening word of prayer. Now, I'd like you to ask your neighbor, and if you're at home sitting next to somebody, ask them, what do you remember Solomon for? Just ask your neighbor, what do you remember Solomon for? I know. That's the question, because some of you have started with how many concubines? Exactly. There is more to Solomon than the concubines and the wives. All right, so at this particular moment, to give us the opening remarks, he's our keynote speaker this wonderful evening at the public lecture on matter Solomonic economics. I'd like to help you, help me actually, put your hands together and help me welcome David Gashoki for the opening remarks. And begin my coffee for darling. So, welcome. Um. My friend, Professor Friend Ogola, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed, good evening. Good evening. It gives me a lot of pleasure to be here today, and especially to be the one giving uh, the opening remarks when Professor is launching his book and also giving us a public lecture. We all know that Professor is a scholar, and I'm sure he has not saved, I mean, anything to do with this scholarly sassiness, scholarly impudence in coming up with really a feisty and flugal piece of material in that book. And we are all looking forward to hearing all that he has done as part of his bigger calling, you know, in making a contribution to our economic management in this country, especially that which affects and impacts our lives in a big way. I know Professor for a while, and I know he has always remained, you know, tenaciously loyal 
at Vivacious to all his social responsibilities. And this is one of them. And I know those of us who will have the opportunity to read this book, and those of us who will have the opportunity of listening to him this evening, will have a lot to gain. You know, I didn't know that as I interacted with professor for many years, inviting me to Strathmore University to share my, strateg my strategic management journey where I've been involved in a number of organizations across the region. I expected to share that with his MBA classes, more so with the international visiting students. I didn't know all along he was looking forward to the points of congruence in the manner we look at various issues. And as I was wondering why he invited me to give this keynote speech, I remembered my two kids, Ian, who is here in the audience, and my daughter, Cherise, have actually passed through his hands. And therefore, I'm very grateful that part of this Solomonic philosophy and economics have actually been imparted in one of my own. I did know, I always make a confession when I'm like doing something like this, that by the time I've done a minute of a speech like this, everybody knows the region I come from. Because more often than not, where I come from, we don't have much of a difference between L and R. Because the last time I was talking to an audience like this, it was a tea convention. And we had people from all over the world, about 55 countries. And every time I decided to talk about the last major event we had in our country, which was about the general elections, every time I told them that you must register, you must have acquired 18 years of age for you to participate. And it happens once every five years. Their eyes kept popping out. At the end of it, an American lady called me aside and asked me, David, were you serious? <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I grew up in Kirinyaga, now you already know, where we do a lot of coffee, tea, rice, and those kind of things. And I want to relate just in two minutes my journey in Kirinyaga, because as we were doing coffee, coffee was a bit of fun, especially in the evenings when you are taking coffee to the factories and we spend the night out there and we had a lot of beautiful adventure in the night. But, but tea was worse because guys had to tie nylon papers in the morning, it was biting cold as they go to the tea farms to pluck, you know, the teas. And many of them suffered pneumonia. But there was once in a year when we would celebrate all this when the coffee payouts and the bonus would come out. And that's the time people go for permanent stone houses, some permanent tiba houses with a nylon sheet roof, and some will buy cars. But our neighbors in the south, where they were doing uh, rice, was even worse. Because for them, they were always suffering of malaria and buhazia. And many of us, we didn't want to visit them and we did not want them to visit us because we fear they were contractors with those diseases. They were so poor that education was a problem. Until at some point, there was sort of a revolution among them, very violent. Because all along they were being treated into squalor. Everything about what they were doing in rice was controlled by NIB, National Irrigation Board. And it was so bad that the entire processing and marketing was controlled. They could not get enough for themselves. At least in tea and coffee, we are better off. Until there's a violent, you know, protest that the market was liberalized and opened up. The place called Moya in Kirinyaga, where all of us really want to be associated with, is today the fastest growing economic zone in Kirinyaga. And their town, Gurubani, is actually the big, not only the biggest, but the fastest growing, even in this country. Now, that starts speaking into the you know, Solomonic economic model. And that's why we're going to listen to this. As I grew up, I kept asking myself a lot of questions of why, why, why. You know, the questions of why is it that we figure out the solutions we have for so many things. Why is it that 
for so many of our farmers, and especially the smallholder farmers, for so many of our people who are in SMEs, why is it that, especially for the farmers, we have never wanted to engage them on the true products of value? We have never truthfully wanted to engage them on the agronomic practices of value. We have never wanted to truthfully engage them on the basic things on post-harvest handling and processing at source, where 70% of value is lost. We've never wanted to engage them much on market access, which unless they are facilitated that the number do not happen, we have never wanted to engage them enough on financial inclusion that will enable them to afford these things, which they can pay up for at the end of the day. I am looking forward to the Solomonic economics. And why is it that those who have been charged with these responsibilities, especially those who are in leadership in one way or the other, whether they are elected, appointed, or nominated, one of the things that is common among most of them, I don't want to say all of them, is that as soon as they assume office, you see their fortunes change. True or false? But we don't see them, see it happening or trickling down from them to the rest of all of us. We have seen elections that are near death issue in this country, yet people are seeking for leadership to lead us into getting Solomonic solutions, the challenges that we face. What is it that happens? What is it that isn't and needs to happen in this country? You know, this and many more, we all have a choice to make. You choose to be, a, to be either part of the problem or part of the solution. It is actually largely an individual solution. I am very happy today that I am here in front of you to cut and race for my friend, Professor Friend Ogola, who will share with us a lot more. I have made a personal decision even as I usher him in. And I wish to invite all of us, those who are in the audience and across this country, to make an individual decision to get into a Solomonic moment. I am part of a team of people who have made a certain decision. I've been part of the tea reforms that have been happening in this country. And with the team of the people I work with, we've come up with a technological solution to two major problems that face our tea farmers, and especially smallholder tea farmers in this country. That the tea farmers live in a vicious debt cycle because it takes too long to turn their tea into money on the minimum 60 days and at times over 120 days. The net implication of this, because they are living on a 30 days accounting cycle, they have to keep borrowing. Most of them are now technically insolvent. That's the truth of the matter. We come up with a technological solution that makes it possible to actually address the cash flow challenge they face, where instead of waiting for 60 days, they can actually get their money in under 10 days. That instead of waiting for people to use their subjective approaches in deciding the quality and the value, it can actually be decided in a matter of two hours in a lab. And instead of that information being only available to a few, because by the time the entire of the East African teas are sold, 90% of it, only 13 people are bought. Yet we have well over 300. But the reason they all can't participate effectively is because the information that would make them do that is only available to a maximum of 40 of them who receive the sample that is distributed to make them make the decision. Okay. So with a scientific approach, this information will be available not only for the rest of all of them, but to the entire world. And open the market to beyond the 13 
to the thousands of them waiting to buy our produce across the world. We have chosen to be part of the solution. Not everybody will be happy with this. Okay. Thank you very much. I am happy to be here mm -hmm. and listen to the Solomonic economics that will make the, what I've talked about okay. not only institutionalized in this country, but a reality in the many days to come. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate who better to set that foundation for this discussion today. Now, as I told you, we have a parked or a jam program, yeah? So the next speaker will suffer the brunt of the last speaker. So if you eat into someone's time, the next one will suffer. But I'm glad that uh, we are in agreement. So without wasting much time, to briefly uh, have a word from our sponsors because we didn't do this alone. We have partners, of course, Standard Group being one of them, Najimudu Empowerment Initiative being the other. We have Trailblazer Business Strategist, TBS, and also we have Efogola uh, Strategist uh, Author. That is uh, part of the partners and one of the reason why we are here, the key reason. And lastly, our main partner is Lofty. Coburn Investment Limited. So at this particular moment, I'd like to welcome Stanley Mutuku, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Lofty Coburn Investment Limited, to give a brief remark from our sponsors. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Lofty Coburn Investments Limited, a firm that is fully licensed by the Capital Markets Authority as a fund manager and the Retirement Benefits Authority as an investment um, manager for pension schemes and pension investments. We are delighted to be here today on the special book launch event by Professor Fred Ogola. We are honored. We are also proud to be the sponsor and partner for this incredible occasion. First and foremost, I would want to extend my heartfelt congratulations to Professor on the publication of this great book, Solomonic Economics. What a name. And I think this is where education meets economics, isn't it? When you look back, see wisdom, then you see Solomon, then you go back to the Bible. A good relation to what Loft Coburn stands for. And Loft Coburn stands for an elevated service as a sacrifice to God. Lofty means elevated. Coban means a sacrifice to God, which is an Hebrew word. And I think we have uh, picked a lot of wisdom from Professor being the one who walked us through the strategic plan for Lofty Coban Investments Limited. And as you can see, our vision is to be the preferred financial services provider in Africa. Our mission is to prudently empower our clients to achieve financial freedom. And I think this is where the rubber meets the road. We just need to understand that we do not have the skill, we do not have the time to analyze, manage, and make decisions for our finances most of the times because we are all blessed differently. And so we need a partner who can be able to walk you through and do this on your behalf. And we say that Loft Coburn Investments Limited stands in for you. As by the introduction, my name is Stanley Mutuku. I'm the CEO of Loft Coburn Investments Limited and the immediate Managing Director, CIC Asset Management Limited. And so we do 
what we have trained in, we have experienced a lot of challenges and knowledge to stand in the gap that already has been identified. And so we are there to make sure that you get what is best for your money. Allow me to congratulate Fred once again for the wisdom that has gone into writing the book. I've perused through the book and it has a lot of knowledge to borrow, especially in the hard times that we are in, in our economics of this country. And it is talking about countries which were where we are about 40, 50 years ago, but they've become um, the best word to use is models on which we can borrow from. Actually, it is said some of them borrowed from us as a country. We have to now borrow from them. And this word Solomonic is very inviting to me. And I would really want to see this because it's a challenge to status quo being implemented to the core. I know we will have questions for Professor. How, where, when did this start? Thank you, everyone. And we welcome you to invest with Loft Coburn Investments Limited. We are at IPS Building, Kimathi Street, first floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stanley, for keeping time. So it is um, five minutes to eight. Prof, we have already eaten into your time, yeah? So it means a paragraph of no. Make sure you present everything. So without wasting much time, I want us to get to the core business that brought us here today. Now, if you are paying attention to the video that was running while you're having snacks, family is a critical ingredient when it comes to application of Solomonic uh, model. Family is at the core of it. So... The presenter of, and the proposer of this particular model, I don't know, because I know he's not a single man. So I believe your family is here, Prof. Yes. I'd like to call upon them, because I've met this young gentleman. Come, sir. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Look sharp. Come on, clap for him. I'd also like to invite uh, Professor's wife, Mpigeni Makofi Tapadali. Welcome, 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 welcome. So, this gentleman is going to introduce himself. We also have a daughter. Hello. Uh, nice, 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 nice. Beautiful. So, Prof, here is your family. Huh? Yes. Just in case they take a photo, crop me out. That's why I'm standing right here. Okay? Because that's the priority. So, he's going to introduce himself. Yeah? And, you know, when we talk about Solomonic uh, model, we have to start infusing while they are young. So, he can't be lecturing us. And in his household, they have no basic understanding. So at this particular moment, I'll give you a microphone. You'll introduce yourself, all right? And say what you have to say. Is that okay? You look lovely and you're a strong young man. So, you ready? Shall we start in three, two, one? Let's go. My name is Matis Madrigala Yanga. For us children, what does Solomonic economics model mean? How can it help us? Wow. Now. How old are you? Five. Ooh. Ask your neighbor, at five years old, what economic model were you thinking about? <laughs> and now, let's hear from the mother. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Herima Moshigadi. And uh, if I answer this young boy here, I can say um, Solomonic economic model as a, a mother who wants to practice it in, into my home, uh, I would like to put it in this example that uh, I'd like to show my kids, rather help them practice on, uh, for example, let's say when I give my son a certain amount of money i would like to teach him that i don't have to be there like tell him this you're supposed to save this one do this and this i want him to understand that i can use a little bit of it and then this one i can 
at least try to save up so that it can help him even uh, mature mentally and on on how to be using his money when he grows up that's the example i would like to use in my household so thank you very much my dear so let us appreciate the family <laughs> incredible now thank you very much you can go sitting matis okay. go with your sister go we'll have a seat thank you very much yeah so fellow kenyans and uh, fellow friends you see this is just coming at the right time i didn't i didn't anticipate it i was anticipating just to make shift so i think that what is critical here is that we just go to the meat of it i was looking for different models remember as a consultant we've done pastel we've done um what is called SWOT analysis we've done avac analysis do you know the frameworks that you have to do different strategies because you told i've done 1000 1400 strategic plans so there are many models in the head but i'm going to present solomonic economic model not as reading the book but as giving you what what can guide you to understand this in our current economic context remember that this this public lecture is inaugurated in kenya but already we have a, a process to go and do it at Yale University. We're also going to do it at Georgetown University. We're also going to do it in, um, I think, Notre Dame University. Those universities wanted me to work there when I was studying in Europe. But fortunately, for the love of my country, I came here because if I didn't come here, maybe I could have not had this lovely family and you, you who are my extended family that have been so much with me. I can't thank you more. To be here, the people who are here are the real people. Uh, who are close to me, but also those who are tuned in online, uh, on air, um, and live. Also, we appreciate you. So I just want to tell you, we're going to use a model called ADCA model. So ADCA model, A, means awareness. What are we aware about? Second thing, what is our desire? Do we have any desire to do anything or change anything? The third one is about knowledge. What knowledge do we need to really move from where we are to where we need to be? And then, of course, uh, what kind of reinforcement uh, ability do we have? Because we have to have ability. Then, of course, la last one is R, which is reinforcement. So, on awareness, you know those who have read Jim Collins says that good is the enemy of great. Uh, simply what he means that when you are good, Kenyans, we are a middle class economy, isn't it? So, we are good. We are good, isn't it? Things are very bad, but you are good. So, that is the enemy of great. So, Solomonic economic model is a world-class model. We cannot just be satisfied by the minimum that we are okay. I can drive my car. I can take my child to school. But do you know how many people outside there, outside the middle class, are not? I was talking to one of my economist, economist friends who told me, the day the middle class will not be able to have Nyamachoma, and the day they won't take their kids to these academies, and the day when they will not be able to go for holiday, that day they will feel the common wananchi. And my problem is the middle class thinking. And we, middle class, are the problem with our middle class thinking. So I want to say that Solomonic economic model will take us to world class thinking. And because I've done a lot of research, when I was studying in Barcelona, I, I sat with Messi and Ronaldo. And I asked them what makes them world class. And that's what I want to share with you. One thing that I got from Ronaldo, Messi, and it was very common, is that world class people have what's called objective reality. They operate from objective reality. They don't operate from delusion. So middle class in Kenya, in developing countries, live on delusion. Things will get better. It will get better. No. It's not going to get better. We can see that things don't happen. They are made to happen. If you wake up and find that things are tough, it's like going to your net. And now you go to your net, the mosquito is winging in your, in your, inside your net, then you say, it's going to leave the, the net. No way, it's going to bite you. The mosquitoes are not going to leave. So I believe that middle class thinking that things will be okay based on hope is not Solomonic. Solomon never solved the issue between the two women using prayer, isn't it? He used thinking. So world class thinking. The second thing I'll say about that is that world class wealth begins with world class thinking. Dear fellow Kenyans, friends, are you having world class thinking? or you are having mindset, uh, middle class thoughts. Thirdly, the middle class thinks, um, uh, thinks on what I would call 
um, when middle class are looking how to solve issues, they tend to have pipe dreams. Pipe dreams. Uh, we have pipe dreams. Remember, pipe dreams are different from vision. So Ronaldo says, I never have pipe dreams. I never delude myself. Ronaldo says that, he told me, Fred, before I go to any, every day, I kick a penalty a hundred times a day. Tell any Kenyan to do anything a hundred times per day. You'll bring me what will be the results. Tell them to save per month. Just saving once per month at Lofty Cavern. You'll see it's not an issue. So Solomonic economic model is about ensuring that we, we the people here, and I want to refer you, there's hope. Mandela said something very interesting. That sometimes it's fall within a generation to be great. And they say, you can be that generation. And I have to be suspicious that we sitting here, as my keynote speaker says, and as you said today, we have to make a deliberate decision not to live in self-delusion. What are your self-delusion? We delude ourselves that we are so competent. We are not. What I mean by we are not is, you may find yourself at work somewhere, and you're feeling you're better than your boss. You are not better than your boss. There are some things you don't know. Maybe you don't even know how to read a speech, but you think you're competent. No one can hire as a CEO if you can't read a speech. So start working on your speech. But saying, me, I'm good, I think the world is not liking me. No. The world has never liked anybody. Not even Jesus was liked by the world, isn't it? Delusion of, 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 of effort. I know people think they work eight hours a day. They don't. You are on WhatsApp at least six hours because your screen, sh screen time shows you you have been on screen for eight hours. What were you doing? Tell me whether you are digging on the screen, isn't it? Whether you are reading on the screen, you know what you are doing on the screen, isn't it? So you are thinking, you are working, putting more effort, and actually you are not. We have a country. You know what everyone is doing. Like now we are looking at the government. What are they doing? Are they putting enough effort in turning the economy? Ask them. Ask your father or mother, when you can't go to school, are they putting enough effort? My son there tells you when he comes, he tells you. He say, I tell him that um, jokers are outside this house. And he says, excuses, don't live in this house. You ask him, he'll tell you. And I think my wife knows that too. Those are the battles I fight. I don't fight any other battle. So after that awareness, it's personal awareness. I go now to economic awareness. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm an economist. We've seen so many economic theories in the world. But somebody came out with, summarized them into a neoclassical economy. We have the Keynesian economy, where we talk about self-correcting. We have the Adam Smith, the invisible hand. I don't want to name them because I don't want to bore you with them. But the point I'm trying to draw is, somebody summarized them. But remember what? These economic theories could not predict the global financial crisis if they did tell me what they told us about it. They couldn't solve it. They couldn't solve or predict what the so-called COVID-19. In fact, we called the virus O1 virus. We were so stupid not to know that it's going to come here. And, and you know how it affected us? Look at the Russia, Ukraine. When it began, we say, oh, wow, you know, those guys are fighting. We never know won't have hunger. I want, there will be no wheat. So these economic models you have been relying on, why is it that they are so deficient that they're not working for you? Now we have the Gaza Strip war, isn't it? We are saying those guys are fighting the Gaza Strip. Those Hamas and Israelis, they are jokers. Do you know what will happen to you? What does Israel connect to you? We are not living here in isolation. We, are not in, we cannot live in a vacuum. This is a, it's become a global village. That, that's true. At the same thing, there is no economy in the world that has remained on the top forever. When I was an economist, I studied that the, global, the current global economic architecture was discovered by the West, which means Europe. Is it not true? Europe was on top. That's why Britain colonized the U.S. But the U.S., with British economic model we're using today, U.S. came and took over the U.S. Isn't, uh, U.S. came and took over the, the Europe, isn't it? Now, do you know in the top four uh, countries in terms of uh, PPP, which means power, uh, uh, power purchasing parity, isn't it? Um, uh, there's no single country from the West in top four. And they're the ones who discover the global financial architecture. That they come here to pitch you, to sell to you. We are sucking it like a sponge, isn't it? Sucking anything like a sponge means you're unsolomonic. I actually say, if you can read a book and believe in it, you don't have to read. If you can read a book and believe everything in a book, including mine, then you don't need to read a book. You need to take what works for you and throw away what does. If you don't know the difference, then you should not even dare read a book because they mislead you. Secondly, the world is on a go slow. Uh, U.S. is suffering with a deficit. 
China is the same. UK is the same. They are trying to do everything possible. It's not working. But when they come to Kenya, they tell you, use this model. And you buy it. And then someone tells you, uh, you know, you, European Bank, European Central Bank, IMF and World Bank has predicted we will grow at 5% if they cannot even grow at 1% themselves. So you are just sucking what they're telling you. So they are not working. They are not working for you. That's what I'm trying to put clear. And remember, in this dilemma I'm talking about, isn't it? I think those who read the Psalms, Psalm 12, uh, Psalms 12, 1 to 16 says, I look up to the mountain. Where will my help come from? And they say, my help comes in the name of the, the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Then for you, why are you trusting World Bank? It is Solomonic to go back to God, isn't it? I'm telling you, it's true. And I told, I, I asked uh, when I was doing study plan for many people here, you've seen them. Uh, for example, Lofty Coven. And they asked me, Fred, which book do you read? I tell them I read the Bible. Because they like, I saw a video, the Bible, uh, the, in the, uh, the Bible, which was founded by, uh, for example, Christians, Christianity is the largest organization in the world. And uh, Jesus is my ultimate strategist. You, the whole answers are in the Bible. If you think you're looking elsewhere, you're joking. If you're a Muslim, you go to Quran. All answers are there. And actually, there are very similarities. And also, we have the golden rule for all religion. Like Christian says, you do, do not do to others what you don't want to be done for you. Muslim says, you're not a believer until you wish your brother well. And this goes even to Bahir Gita, even the Baha'i faith. All of them are just riddled in the same thing. Uh, so what I want to say short is that this doesn't work. Then the second thing which doesn't work, as an economist who are taught that the first form of economics is hunting and gathering, isn't it? Like in my place in Ugenya, we used to eat mapera. That is guavas, isn't it? You just wake up, you pluck a guava, you eat and you sleep, right? And things are good, isn't it? And some people are still living here. The second economic uh, uh, continuum, if you go there, is called agrarian, where now you plant, you grow, like my brother here, tea, and of course you eat, but you don't do anything, you just drink tea. Uh, if a tea, tea can be drunk without any value addition, but I think that we just grow bananas and eat them like that. Agrarian, you feed yourself from the farm. The, the third one is called industrialization, where now you manufacture, isn't it? And you do a value addition. That's the third level. The fourth level is called de-industrialization. means that now you are not, the bigger chunk of the economy is coming from the service sector, but not manufacturing sector. I'll give you where we are in Kenya. And the last one now, which is now only in the U.S. at the moment, is called re-industrialization. Now we use the data from the service sector, for example, from the investment sector, insurance sector, the banking sector, IT sector, telco sector, to now birth a new economy where you can now manufacture robots, isn't it? You can do robotics. So that is called re-industrialization. It's called tech manufacturing. Now, in that continuum, where is Kenya? Well, I mean, Kenya is oscillating between hunting and gathering and agrarian, unfortunately. <laughs> because during, when there was drought here, didn't you hear, see people eating fruits and eating roots and picking leaves and eating? Is it? Yeah, am, am I not the one who saw it? You only saw it, isn't it? Which means we are oscillating between the two. Now, developed countries are telling you, you should follow this continuum faithfully. And I say, no, that's unsolomonic. Why? Britain became the workshop for the world 4,000 years ago. Workshop of the world means they industrialized 4,000 years ago. So they're telling you, now you move from agrarian to manufacturing and achieve what they achieved 4,000 years ago and compete with them. Now, the problem is, when your competitors start advising you, there's something wrong. Isn't it? If we're fighting over a girl with you, they'll tell you, this girl likes eating chips, buy for her. Isn't it? If you follow my advice, you lose it. Isn't it? So when Britain tells you this, how you need to grow, do you think that Britain sincerely want us to grow? The king is in town, right? But what has he brought? The king has brought a handout to head of state, isn't it? 800 million, isn't it? The king has left the entire European Premier League in the UK and Kenyan people are in suffering. If I was the king, I could have known that you cannot trust a Kenyan with money in their hand. You bring Premier League to develop the Kenyan Premier League and you grow the economy. Curious, 
are among the third largest exporters in this country, and we export more to UK. He could have told us how to merge these two markets, isn't it? Uh, UK market, and these conversations I'm seeing in state house, people are taking tea. Kenyans, we are having small conversations, like, you know, Rala was in state house. I saw him shaking these hands. Can that put bread on the table to somebody who is uh, hungry tonight? So I'm trying to say, we need to move from the model being told to us, which is not working in their country. The commonwealth is collapsing in the hands of the king, right? Why don't he fix it? If he can advise Kenyans where to go. I'm just being honest because Solomon was very honest about the results of what happened, isn't it? So I'm saying that these things are misleading and we cannot be told to go back at the end. And let us just t tell me the following. Let's not forget many college students uh, who are struggling to raise school fees, isn't it? How will this help them? This continuum we are talking about. Not forget university students who have now mishelp scholarship. Have they not? But you are sitting here discussing about the king. Isn't it? I'm not saying it's bad. Let's not forget the many graduates who have just hustling. They have no jobs, isn't it? Remember what happened in Abakasi. 7,000 people turning out for 100 jobs, isn't it? Let's not forget the business people who are running due losses because of bad economic high taxes. Uh, also, we are talking about those who cannot afford minimum health care. Um, the middle class, as you tell me, you are only one disease away from poverty. I usually see some of our friends whom I think is well to do. Then when they lose a friend, they are opening up a WhatsApp group. Now they are saying we need to help them. But when I'm telling them we need to face this head on, they're telling me, Fred, don't be a politician, isn't it? I, 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 I find there's a schizophrenia schizophrenia whereby this side thinks things are okay and this side can open a WhatsApp group for fundraising. I, I find that schizophrenic. I'm not saying it's bad to do schizophrenia. Now what has happened in Kenya is that we are left with two options because Kenyans went to these 22 elections um, with the two sides, isn't it? One side said they had a plan, isn't it? Which you know where the planning is going, isn't it? The other side called Azimio, they had the system and they had the deep set, isn't it? But they were declared losers. So what option do we have? They have gone to BOMAS, and we are waiting for a solution for BOMAS. But I know at best, BOMAS is a ceasefire. Uh, ceasefire means nothing is coming out of it. And I'm not just being, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not being pessimistic. But sometimes you have to know pessimism is smarter than being optimist. You can be op optimistic by saying things will get well, and you know nothing you're doing about it. But a pessimist will open that net and smash the, the mosquito, then go to bed. Because that's the only way to sleep, isn't it? But up to the mosquito will die, they don't die. They will just bite you. So I've also done what's called root cause analysis about all these things. And I can tell you where is it, because we are talking about still about awareness, isn't it? Because I have to tell you, where are we? We have done root cause analysis and discovered one thing. And I'll tell you one thing that is stopping us is called politics of identity. One professor of uh, uh, politics called Daniel Arab Moy said, Sasambaya, Maisha. By, isn't it? Police of identity, don't even blame who is, me, I'm not even blaming who is in charge of Kenya. It is us with our politics of identity. I'll give an example, for example, in Siaya. The governor comes from game, isn't, uh, from Ugenya, isn't it? So then they do arithmetic saying, now the senator must come from Bondo. Those are identity politics, isn't it? Then the women must come from game. And then you start dividing, and when you go to game, there are also clans. You have to identify with something until you identify with nothing. I'm telling you, that won't take us anywhere. That is chronism, isn't it? And it's called chroninomics, isn't it? So let us leave chroninomics and embrace what? Solomonic. Because that is what actually is real in this country and is hurting us so much. I'm done with the word called awareness. So are you aware? The second thing I'm going to on the model is called desire. Desire for change. If I were to ask you, what do you desire for your beloved country, Kenya? You tell me lofty things, isn't it? In fact, during campaigns, your politician tells you great things. And they tell you the issue of Singapore. We were the same with Singapore that time, isn't it? After I elect them, they start comparing with Juba. They say, no, Juba is not doing very bad. I think we are, we are better than Juba. So why do they sell you Singapore during the campaign? Korea, Japan, during the, during the campaign, isn't it? We will make Singapore, we'll be like Singapore. We'll be a fast world. By the way, all the campaigns in Kenya during 22, people are hopeful that whether this side won or the other, things will be okay, isn't it? You had no choice, man. So what I'm trying to say here is that your desire is a peaceful country. 
no one thrive when there is no peace. We have talked about Vision 2030, isn't it? Which we, it's always being quoted in strategic plan document. I'm always forced to quote it, but I know nothing is going on it. So this desire is also cannot be cannot be doing well in this desire if we don't go back to God. I'm telling you, when we put God aside, everything goes wrong. I, I, I know you can say whatever you like that churches have lost it. They have not lost it. It is the Christians in the church that have lost it. There's no church that has lost anything. If you are a Christian in the church and you are doing wrong things, up to you. And that's why you saw I came with my family and I tell people, whatever you see in parliament, whatever you see in senate, whatever you see in the uh, county assembly, those are the reflection of our families because every one of them come from a family. So you've taught them how to be corrupt at home, then they go to assembly and do it. So just doing what you are doing very well at home. Because if you look here, the awareness here is about King Solomon. King Solomon came and asked God to give him the wisdom to lead his country. And the results were enormous. You are told how you could even collect uh, gold, isn't it? You could pick maybe diamond, milk was all over the place. You could, be, you could see anything going on well. Population growth was on the roof. Everybody was happy. That's what we desire for our country, isn't it? And the issue is, <clears throat> we have desire for goodness, but <clears throat> we do not have the sacrifices to make the change. Everybody wants good things, but no one wants to change anything to improve the situation. And I can tell you, because I'm a father of three, and uh, I have a son here that I'm the first one who put on his diapers when he was young, uh, when he was just born. The only person who wants change in this world is who? Is a baby in wet diapers. None of us wants change. None of us, all of us are threatened by change. But a baby in wet diapers will tell you, please change me. It is only when our diapers will be wet enough in Kenya that we'll change. In fact, sometimes I tell you, the leaders we got, God has given to us to teach us a lesson. Just like God gave Pharaoh to Israelites to teach them a lesson enough so that they can wake up, isn't it? And be able to fill the wet diapers. And Kenyans who are still not seeing this need for change on our economic model, we are still satisfied. And let me tell you what, my dear brothers and sisters. Resisting change is like holding your breath. If you succeed, you die. So if we don't change Kenyans, we are holding our breath, hoping we will be alive, we won't. That's truth. It's biological truth. Hold your breath now. We shall call first aid for you, isn't it? And I believe that we need to go back to the covenants. If you look at our constitution, 2010, we have the seventh covenant. And I have a dream. That through Solomonic economics, we can achieve Solomon, we can achieve what Solomon achieved for his country. I also have a dream that Solomonic economics, we can wake up this sleeping lion to overtake the tiger. Imagine an African continent is a lion sleeping, being overtaken by the Asian tiger, a lion praising a tiger, how a tiger is powerful, is completely a joke for me. Uh, what we have is an arsenal. I've told you Africa is among the greatest. Solomon was a man of God. He acted justly. He loved tenderly and humbly before God, isn't it? God strongly indeed helped him to rule a country. And for us, we are still thinking that someone who comes with uh, things we can't understand, which does not come from God, isn't it? And we buy into it and we propel them to power and wish that they are going to rule us Solomonically. They won't. Because they were not Solomon from home. They were not Solomon anywhere. You, you, you elect somebody to lead you, even you appoint a CEO, someone in charge of your finance, who has no any Solomonic history of leading as a leader, then you say they are going to be okay. That is being optimistic. That's being middle class with a pipe dream. There's no vision. Vision will bring all this. And I can tell you, being a father of a catechist, my father was a catechist, I can tell you, I, I, I can tell you how faith has strengthened me. Uh, how faith has helped me on the things I've been able to do. And how, even faith, when I was in Europe, I was in Barcelona, the city that you can get lost in. Uh, if Ronaldinho got lost in Barcelona, who cannot? Barcelona has fun, isn't it? But I focus solomonically on my prayers because my father told me I have to go to church, isn't it? I had to pray a lot to stay looking at my thing. And I remember uh, something about Obama. Obama had written a book called... Um, 
Obama has written a book, a very lovely book, which is called uh, um, A Promised Land. And Obama says the bet. First, Obama says he did a bet on the right woman. And I tell you, for men who are not yet married, if you don't marry the right woman, uh, you've, you've created 80% of your problems. If you marry the right one, 80% of your problems are solved. And if you get the wrong one, you just become a philosopher. You say all women are, you say all women are dogs, all women are bitches, isn't it? So I'm telling you, there are some decisions you have to make for yourself so that you can aspire yourself to the next level. And remember, our national anthem begins but O oh God of all creation, bless this, our land and nation. Did you do like that before you did a prayer? If all Kenyans went to a ballot and prayed before voting, they'll be successful. And I can tell you, when I went to the gym, the first time when I, I was very big, I didn't have muscles, I was looking very uh, funny. <laughs> what I did was that I went to the gym and the gym master told me, Fred, you want to work out? Yes. Let me tell you what. Eh? You want to have big chest and good biceps and triceps? I said, yes. He told me, Fred, we don't start from there. Let's start from the leg. So, you know, if you have to have a strong leg to have a strong back, isn't it? What is your leg? Is your MCA. You have elected a bad MCA because you ate 100 shillings. You have lost the leg, isn't it? And the back is your governor. If you have the wrong back, you are lost. Then the chest, the watch chest is your president. So you've got it wrong in the MCA. You have no leg. You have no back. Then you have no watches. Then you sit here in prayer going to church. Let us pray for our leaders to lead as well. Already you got it wrong. Why are you praying to lead you well? Why don't you choose the right leader? You are abdicating your responsibility. You are unsolomonic. So I'm told there should be a, a short commercial break. We have done awareness, isn't it? Do you have a desire to change? Do I see the desire in your face? Don't you see? Now, when we come back from the break, we shall give you the knowledge to change. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I'm, I'm happy for the teaser. So, we've, we've tackled awareness, we've tackled uh, desire, we have knowledge, ability, and reinforcement. Yes. But at this particular moment, before we take a short commercial break, I'd like us to unveil, because all this has been packaged for not only people here, but across the country. Is that okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do a countdown in three, okay? When I do a countdown, let us appreciate... Uh, put your hands together as we unveil this book, then it will be open to the general populace. Is that okay? All right, so at this particular moment, I'd like to call on Prof. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, I'm glad you said uh, the backbone is the governor and the legs are MCS, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah, my legs are weak. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but we thank God, yeah? So we have Professor, Chief uh, please, sir, keynote address, our prof professor's friend. We are here. So at this particular moment, I'd like to count us down, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in five, looking sharp. In four, looking sharp. In three, I'm looking sharp. In two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands up together. And let us, let us, let us, let us appreciate Solomonic economics, the big leap, the mega jump, and we have copies available in the country. Remember, sir, move closer, move closer to your book. I know you know the content. I know you know the content. Yes, yes, look at that lovely, lovely book. Grab a copy, forward by Dr. Habi Lolaka. Only 2,500 shillings, and you get to understand. Solomonic economic model. Well, it is the great leap, and at this particular moment, we like to take a small leap. We call it a break in the TV world. But when you come back, we have more details in regards to what is in here. But right now, it is the Solomonic economics. Let's take the break. We'll return with more. Let us appreciate again, once again. Beautiful, beautiful. There we are. And I've realized the shines are over.